Our approach to frugal gardening isn't just to look for great deals on gardening products, though that can sometimes be very helpful. Instead, it's to not buy these products at all whenever possible. We also try to limit our use of purchased inputs like water and electricity. Today I'll share 10 strategies that allow us to get excellent results while spending very little money on products and other inputs. On the 10th strategy, I'll be joined by Chris Towerton, who will share how he uses permaculture principles to conserve water on his property in Australia. The first strategy is to have your soil tested before buying fertilizers and amendments. People often think of a soil test as a way to learn what they need to add to the soil. But more often than not, the real value is in learning what not to add. When you know what your soil doesn't need, you can avoid buying unnecessary fertilizers and amendments and save money in the process. In our case, even though we haven't used store-bought fertilizers for many years, a soil test showed high or very high levels of most nutrients. And all we do is add compost, worm castings, and mulch to the garden. With nutrient levels as high as they are, we can actually use less compost in order to bring them down. If you live in the United States, low-cost professional soil testing is available through your local agricultural extension office. Some states even offer free testing. Either way, soil testing can save you a lot of money over the long run by helping you to identify what products you don't need. You may even find, like we did, that no additional fertilization is needed. The second strategy to reduce your gardening costs is to make your own compost from free local resources. The amount of compost you'll need will vary depending on your soil test results. But if the results show your soil needs more organic matter and nutrients, a good target is to produce enough compost to cover your garden beds with a half inch to an inch of compost per year. Compost adds nutrients and beneficial microbes to the soil, improves soil structure, increases nutrient and water retention, and promotes plant health and growth. When soil is deficient in nutrients, compost alone can often correct the deficiencies. And the good news is that you can usually find all of the compost inputs you need without spending a penny. The best place to start looking for free compost ingredients is on your own property. You can use kitchen scraps, autumn leaves, grass clippings, and other yard and garden waste. If this isn't enough material to produce a half inch to an inch of compost per year, you can look for free local resources in your community. Where we live, there's an amazing abundance of free resources for compost. And as many of you probably know, when I started this channel, I was on a mission to find as many as I could. In my early videos, I took you along as I scavenged for leaves, wood chips, grass clippings, used coffee grounds, spent brewery grains, and horse manure. You may have different free resources where you live, but if you look hard enough, you can usually find more than enough to make all the compost you'll need. The third strategy is to mulch garden beds using free local organic resources. Mulching has numerous benefits, including saving water, feeding the soil food web, controlling weeds, and reducing erosion. And all of these benefits can be achieved without spending a penny on products. Some of our favorite free local mulch ingredients are autumn leaves, wood chips, grass clippings, chop and drop garden waste, ground eggshells, and small amounts of used coffee grounds. Free straw isn't available where we live, but we'd definitely use it if it was. Now let's look at four specific ways that mulch saves you money. First, it covers the soil, which reduces evaporation and holds moisture in the soil. As a result, you're going to have a lower water bill. Secondly, it slowly releases nutrients into the soil, which means you can use less fertilizer. Third, you may have heard about how great worm castings are for your soil, but fortunately you don't have to buy them. A better approach is to mulch your garden beds. Mulch feeds worms, gives them an excellent habitat, and protects them from temperature extremes. Mulching will significantly increase your native earthworm population and the amount of worm castings in your garden. Fourth, mycorrhizal fungi form beneficial symbiotic relationships with a number of plants. The plants provide the fungi with carbohydrates and B vitamins, and the fungi provide the plants with an increased uptake of water and nutrients. However, the best way to promote mycorrhizae in your garden isn't to buy mycorrhizae products. Instead, it's simply to grow a broad diversity of plants that form mycorrhizal associations, and to use coarse mulches like wood chips and leaves, which create an environment in which native mycorrhizal fungi flourish. The fourth money-saving strategy is to grow nitrogen-fixing cover crops. We haven't used any nitrogen fertilizer for many years thanks in part to these crops. Late every summer, we plant about $5 worth of cover crop seeds. The plants grow, fix nitrogen in the soil, and then they're killed by the winter cold. If your winters aren't cold enough to kill your cover crops, you'll need to chop and drop them before they go to seed. In addition to fixing nitrogen, cover crops prevent erosion and increase organic matter in the soil. I've provided a link to the seed mix we use in the description below. 
Our fifth money-saving strategy is to grow in polycultures to reduce pest and disease problems and therefore reduce pesticide costs. We choose not to use any conventional pesticides, and we also rarely use organic ones. Yet our plants have very few pest and disease problems. Polycultures help make this possible. This bed is the best example of a polyculture in our garden. It contains a wide variety of interplanted, unrelated crops. This makes it more difficult for pests to find their preferred plants and wreak havoc. Imagine instead this bed planted in a monoculture of nothing but cabbage plants. It's hard to imagine a better location for cabbage moths to lay their eggs. It would be easy for them to find. Their offspring would have more than enough food to eat. A bed planted with nothing but cabbage is really the ideal environment for cabbage worms. Likewise, if we planted all of our squash plants in the same location, you can imagine how much easier it would be for powdery mildew to spread from plant to plant than it would be if the plants were scattered around the garden in a variety of locations. Simply put, monocultures create the perfect environment for pests to find their food source, lay eggs, and reproduce, while polycultures make their work of destruction much more difficult. My sixth money-saving tip is to grow plenty of edible perennials and self-sowing annuals. This bed is absolutely loaded with both. In fact, only about 10% of the plants you see here were intentionally planted this year or last year. The rest are self-sowing annuals and edible perennials that have been here for years. Perennial crops are ones that you plant once and they come back year after year on their own. Whereas self-sowing annuals only live one season, but they produce and drop enough seed that they effectively self-sow another crop for the next season. These plants save us money because they only have to be planted once and they come back year after year with minimal care and no additional cost. Because we use only free local resources to amend the soil. In addition to the plants in this bed, there are other perennials and self-sown annuals all over the garden. Though they're not in season yet, some very popular perennials we're growing include asparagus, strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, and Asian pears. Our seventh money-saving tip is to save seeds. We keep our seed costs down by saving seeds for a wide variety of crops, including tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, cucumbers, squash, pumpkins, kale, collard greens, and mustard greens. These are not only some of our favorite crops, but the seeds are very easy to save. We store the seeds in small plastic bags and airtight containers to improve their longevity, and store the containers in a cool, dark cabinet. The eighth tip is to grow most crops from seed rather than buying plant starts. You can often buy about 100 seeds for the price of a plant start, so the savings are significant. The savings are even greater if you use saved seeds. Direct sowing brings even greater savings. Though we start tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants in the grow room, we start most of our plants directly in the soil. As a result, we don't have to add more lights and shelves to our grow room, we save on electricity, and we don't have to buy seed starting trays and potting soil for crops that are directly sown. The ninth money-saving tip is to reuse, repurpose, and upcycle. Over the years, we've used fallen trees as garden bed borders, built a compost bin from discarded pallets and another from tree branches, built cold frames from old storm windows and scrap wood, and started plants in repurposed cottage cheese and yogurt containers. The possibilities for repurposing, reusing, and upcycling are endless. Our tenth money-saving strategy is to conserve water. We usually get plenty of rain here in the Chicago area, but we still take measures to reduce our use of tap water in the garden. First, as just discussed, we mulch our garden beds. Mulching is the easiest way to significantly reduce water use in the garden, and it doesn't cost a thing if you use free local resources for your mulch. Second, we harvest rainwater from the roof in a rain barrel and use it to water the garden. Third, we reuse water whenever possible. For example, we save the water that we use to rinse our produce and we water our plants with it. We also reuse the water that's collected by the dehumidifier that we sometimes run in our basement. If we lived in a more drought prone area, we take even more measures. For example, I'd consider installing a gray water system that safely diverts some wastewater from the house into the garden. I'd also build wicking beds instead of traditional raised beds. Wicking beds hold a reservoir of water under the soil, and the water is wicked up from the bottom, resulting in much less water loss to evaporation. I highly recommend Rob Bob's YouTube channel for those of you who might be interested in wicking beds. Please see the description for links to a couple of Rob's wicking bed videos. Finally, I'd apply permaculture water saving strategies. As promised, for more on that topic, here's a clip from Chris Towerton. G'day Patrick, thanks for having us on. Well, from a permaculture design perspective, generally we begin by considering what resources are entering and leaving the system. 
Now for our particular block, which I guess would be similar to most in the urban environment, when considering water, we came up with three primary inputs, that being surface runoff, direct precipitation, and of course the town supply. For outputs, we were thinking evaporation, transpiration, stormwater collection, again surface runoff, and of course the town sewer. One of the main purposes then for a good water design is an attempt to slow the transition between resources entering our system and leaving it. Those familiar with our clips are likely to know that primarily we post them as a record of what we've been learning. So without a great experimental knowledge and not wanting to simply regurgitate what we ourselves have read, I'd rather point you to the resources that we've been finding most useful. Now this will possibly come across as a plug, but it isn't. On this particular subject, I think you'd be hard pressed to find more focused information than that contained in the book series Rainwater Harvesting for Drylands and Beyond by Brad Lancaster. They contain a good variety of methods for a pretty wide variety of situations. Nearly all the techniques are given in good detail and for those that require calculation, those mathematical calculations are given to help size the installations on the landscape. Although we're only part way through implementing our water design, we're pretty happy with the changes we've made so far. One of the more interesting and probably the only one we'll get a chance to look at today for the sake of time is our swale system up here on the council verge. In the past, the word swale was generally referring to low moist tracts of land, but it's sort of been commandeered in a modern sense, particularly in the permaculture circles, to refer to a ditch and berm on contour. Prior to the installation of our swales, on a heavy rainfall event, we'd get a lot of surface runoff that would simply travel down our driveway and then off the property. Now, of course, that was not only a loss of a valuable resource, the water itself, but lower down, the water would hit gardens at high speed and take with it much of the organic matter that we'd been busy trying to build up. So when it came time to look for a solution up here, we found that swales ticked all the boxes. As far as their functionality goes, along with many other water harvesting earthworks, they really are just a mimicry of nature. Here in this little gully we see how a down tree works to slow and spread the passage of water, allowing the accumulation of organic matter and giving ephemeral flows a better chance at sinking into the landscape. It's this sinking of water into the landscape that makes swales so attractive from a design perspective. Over time this process can restore an enormous amount of water to the soil. During dry spells, plants are often still able to maintain access to this slow moving lens of water. So all this ties in really well with one of the objectives we mentioned earlier concerning the water design. That being that this is the highest point in our little catchment, so to sink water in here means that that water will need to take the longest journey through our system and presumably give us the most benefit. Lachooks have done a pretty good job at disguising what these swales actually look like by pulling organic material down into the ditches. But rather than discourage it, we actually take advantage of the fact that the ditches themselves are generally more moist than the slopes. This moisture can support additional life, which means that more organic material can be broken down more quickly. This hive of activity is constantly tilling the soil underneath, and that's exactly what we want. After all, we're not building a dam, we're looking at infiltrating the water into the landscape. Stripping back the mulch, we can see the bare bones of our swale system. The system itself sits on a slope which is approximately 4 to 1, or 25%. Each swale has three basic components. There's the berm, which includes the two returns, a ditch in behind, and then the spillway. This spillway is there for the safe carriage of water should we ever have a catastrophic rainfall event. Now while we don't use chemical fertilisers, we do use animal manures and various other organic materials to help amend our gardens the leachates of which are above and beyond the nutrient load acceptable for our local bush. So one of the other very important aspects about this form of water harvesting earthwork is their ability to hang on to those nutrients. Anyways, I hope you've gotten something from this quick overview of one of the techniques we're using to conserve water here. Patrick, again, thanks for having us on, and I'm really looking forward to seeing the rest of your series. Hooroo. I'd like to thank Chris for the time and effort he put into making that excellent clip. Please see the description for a link to Chris's channel and the sources he cited in the clip. I hope this video gave some food for thought on ways that you might be able to save some money in the garden. If you have some money saving tips you'd like to share, please let me know in a comment below. Well that's all for now. Thank you very much for watching. And until next time, remember, you can change the world one yard at a time.